Uh, I was in the service from uh, September 1968 to September 1972. That was right during the heaviest uh, fighting of the Vietnam War. I was able to take some tests with, uh, through the Air Force recruiter, uh, scored high enough in a couple of the areas that I was able to enlist in the, in the Air Force. And so then from there, I let my family know that I was, that's what it was a four-year commitment, and that, that was it. My mom wasn't very pleased. She didn't want me going into the military at all, but uh, especially during that war. But uh, at least it was a better, it, was, it seemed like a, at that time a safer way to go. I had to fly out of San Francisco. Uh, that was kind of a strange flight, realizing that uh, you know, I was headed to Southeast Asia. It was a huge plane, uh, but it was completely full of GIs heading overseas somewhere. We flew into the night, and it just seemed like we were on the plane forever. It was a very long ride. Being dark, it made it even a longer ride. Uh, and you, I just, you know, you would look around and realize, you know, these are Army guys, Navy, all, all different branches were on this plane going to Southeast Asia. When I got to Bangkok, and I remember getting on the bus with all the other GIs, looking down outside and seeing all the, the Thai people. You know, they just all were looking up at the bus, looking up at us. And it was just kind of strange because I had really never seen people like that before or been to that country or anything like that before. This was brand new for me. So as I finally got up to my base, um, I remember flying in. I looked down, and the first thing I see is I see a bunch of ball fields down there. and, and um, Military guys are, are, are playing are playing softball. I was assigned to the security police squad, and so part of my work was in what they call security police administration. So I did some office work with security police. We took a, we took a lot of the extra firearms training. We took a lot of extra uh, security combat training at my base in Louisiana before I went over, because we knew that we would be we had a, a lot of assignments right on the base. When you, when you do security police on an Air Force base, it's a lot like being a policeman on, in a city. Everything that happens in a city happens on an Air Force base. And my first assignment when I got to uh, my base uh, was uh, flight line duty. And so we would have a certain area of the, of the flight line we would cover, and our job was to protect both the aircraft that was in our area plus the entire uh, runway area. The first people I met there, uh, I had a tech sergeant, I still remember their names, the, the tech sergeant Lewis, he was like my, my boss, and then there was a staff sergeant Kennedy. Staff sergeant Kennedy loved the Cincinnati Reds. They were both good guys, they were good guys to work with, and we had a, our, our commander at the base there was uh, 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 Colonel Bug, was his name, and he was very, uh, for being a lieutenant colonel, he was really down to earth. And, and treated everybody well, and that was nice. And then I got to know a lot of the other uh, security uh, security police guys just by working the different shifts with them. But the people that uh, people that I met in both both Thailand and Vietnam, not not the Americans I worked with, but the nationals, the, 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 the Thailand people and the, and the Vietnamese people, for the most part, were were nice people. I, after I came home and got through all that, I, I really did not have a lot of bad feelings or, or hatred for you know, for those those countries. Um, you know, you, you detest who you're fighting against, but the, the regular people that you know they're just trying to live their lives too. So uh, I never really held anything against them. I made six different what I call trips out into the into the fighting area where, you know, we would go out and by helicopter and, you know, take us in and drop us off. And we would, you know, we would be out there for maybe a day or two with, with actually taking on the end. We always got some, some notification as to when, when we were going to go out. There would be a time so that we could prepare and get our gear together. There was always some anxiety, uh, you know, because uh, anytime you go out into a, to a combat area, you know, there's, you're, you're aware of, uh, you know, the dangers that are out there. Once I got on the helicopter and, and we took off, for a while you just sort of sit in the helicopter and just, just try not to think about too much. 
But then as we as we would hear the, the pilots come back where, where they could talk to us and they would be telling us how, how close we were or when we would be going down, then you know you, you start getting uh, a little more pumped up and scared. And it was always a scary time. Anytime you're anybody's in combat there there are times to be scared. As soon as we do hit the ground and then we're off running, uh, looking for cover, that's the first thing we do. And at that point we would just spread out and you're always you're always looking to protect your buddies that you're with. Because that's that's the most important thing we're doing at that point. We would get down and just wherever they were at is you know, we just kinda take them on at that point. And sometimes the, the, these fights could go fairly quickly. Maybe they would retreat. Um, and sometimes they were, they were kind of prolonged, like they were, you know, we would be there for a while. And sometimes we would, uh, if they were retreating, then we would advance because we were going after them. Because that's how we normally fought them. We had to go take them on because they always used guerrilla-like tactics, so they would, they would like hit and run. But we always had to be careful because they knew where they were advancing to. And if we, if we went too far after them, then that, that probably meant that they were setting a trap. And, and the problem was, we very rarely ever saw any of them. I mean, sometimes we would know where, where, where to shoot at because we could see flashes coming from wherever they were at. So it's like we were trying to fight a war and we never, we, we hardly ever saw the bad guys. And that's where our, our uh, squad leaders and, and the, uh, uh, the captains and you know, the people in charge came in because they we learned to listen to them and that's how, in a lot of situations, uh, people that are actually in, in a combat situation get in and out of, that, uh, out of that fight. I never really had the intent of shooting that guy or that guy, but it was always like they're, they're trying to kill us, so we have to try to kill them first. That's, that's just how warfare is when you're in, in a combat situation. Did you get injured? I did not. No, I got... I got through okay. I did see some, some of our guys get hit. I don't know that any of them uh, died from their wounds. Because sometimes once they get airlifted out, uh, then we lose, we lose track of them after that. So we, even now I still can remember the sound of the, the whirring sound of the, of the helicopter blades. Uh, you know, just the, the image of you know, when you look up, you see a whole bunch of helicopters coming in. This is what we call coming home day. There's a certain number of girls who are assigned to a barracks, and they wash, they wash and press all of our clothes, shine our boots, uh, do our laundry, and uh, make our beds and just clean up after us. But they were really nice, and they were always sad when we left, and, and they're the ones who started giving everybody these lays to wear when we go home. Uh, that's always a, 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 a neat day especially when it's your day to get them, but as you're getting closer to coming home and you go to the airport with other guys who are getting them, then the, the anticipation builds, you know, and you really start thinking, you know, my day's coming pretty soon. By the time that I was ready to come home, I knew that there was a, the, the country was really divided. You have to keep in mind, the Vietnam War was the first war that was really televised back home. And, and what it did was, the the, the American soldiers coming back were kind of stained by that. that. Like we were all bad people like that. As the Americans were coming home, they were not being welcomed back like we do our troops now. You know, they were, a lot of people were at the airport that were being hostile to them, were, were yelling at them, uh, calling them baby killers. So some of the guys, when they got to the airport, would actually go into uh, a restroom at the airport, change out of their uniform, some guys threw the uniform away to go through what they did and then come home and be subjected to that was really too bad. Because for the most part, they're all decent people. They're just doing what they were trained to do. Uh, that's always kind of what I felt I did. Whatever I was doing, I, I tried to do it the right way and I did what I was trained. So I was, I was okay with that. I wasn't real happy with how the war was run. Uh, because I, I realized when I was over there, I mean, Physically, we can't beat those people. That was a little discouraging when I realized that we had really probably extended it too long to where so many more people got, got killed and hurt. But I was kind of really questioning what are we accomplishing? 
my orders came through, what we call TDY orders, temporary duty orders came through and I was reassigned to Benoit Air Base in South Vietnam, then I had to decide whether to tell anybody that I, I was where I was going or not. And I, I knew that my uh, my parents had, had been concerned when I first had to go in, but I just felt like I didn't want to uh, put them through that that ordeal of, of every day worrying about what's what's going on. So so my decision was not to not to tell them then. Because I figured if nothing happens, if, if I go over there, I do my thing, I go back to Thailand, everything's okay. Or if you know, if for some reason the worst happened, if I if I was killed in action, then you know they're gonna they're gonna know anyway. When I when I got home, uh, I remember, and I got off the bus at the airport that night, and the buses brought us up from Louisville. My mom was the first person to greet me. And uh, she just gave me a hug and just wouldn't let go. The more I thought about it, I decided I, I'm, at least for now, I'm not going to say anything about being reassigned to Vietnam because she's happy, everybody's happy I got home. So I, I didn't, I just decided at that point not to say anything and just let, let, it, let it ride. And the longer, the longer it went, the less the less I thought about it. Well, really, the less I wanted to think about it. And so I just I didn't want to bring it up. In the beginning, when I got home, I did have some some um, like flashbacks from some of the fighting that went on. But then over a period of time, those have, those went away. And so you know, I just I just moved on with everything. But it wasn't until my my nephew who was still in high school at Troy, signed up for the Army Reserve uh, during the Iraq War. I was talking to him about what kind of training he had been taking, getting ready for that, and it brought back all kinds of, just like waves of memories I had of, of my, my time. So I started uh, almost like reliving some of the things that I had gone through before. And so I finally had to, had to talk to my wife and explain to her what, what had happened way back. I shared it with with, the children, with my children and then with my family and my extended family. And that was a relief. What I've got here are um, the uh, the ribbons and the medals that I earned uh, for my my four years in the in the Air Force. Identifies Air Force, uh, identifies as an Air Force veteran, identifies a Vietnam War veteran, the Vietnam Campaign Medal, a Vietnam Service Medal. Combat Service Medal, National Defense, Good Conduct Medal, American Defense, a Cold War Victory, Overseas Service, Air Force Service, Honorable Service. Patch here and the, the Honor honor Guard patch here uh, are ones that I got for being on the, the base Honor Guard group in my, my base in Louisiana, England Air Force Base, Louisiana, before I went overseas. And I was part of a group that um, uh, would go out on and, and do the military funerals. Most of the time I was on the group that did the 21 gun salute and two times I was actually able to be the person that presented the flag to the to the family which was very special. I think it was the, the two times when I actually presented the flag uh, to the family member. Both times I think it was it was the widow so I would get down on, on one knee so I'm right in front of the widow but I, I still remember after I after I had gave the regular uh, saying that we that we do and present the flag to her, uh, I remember telling both widows that I have a lot of respect for your husband and I thank him for his service. I still remember that. Of everything on here on this board, the two patches for for what I did for for being on the the honor guard is probably the most meaningful thing that I. Uh, that I did for my during my four years in, in the Air Force. I've been on, uh, for the, the honor flight trips, I've been on 34, 34 honor flights. And we always go to, the Vietnam is one of the ones we always go to. So I, I see it every time. It's always kind of special to go. 
Uh, but, but one of the main reasons I go now is if you know if I'm taking a picture of a deceased Vietnam veteran for a family, then that's that's important to me to do that. What we do is is to make sure that our veterans, whether they're World War II uh, or Korea, when when they take this trip, they're going to be thanked many times over during the day by lots of people. We not only get, get to show them all these memorials in one day, but every place we go, whether it's in the airport, uh, when we come in in the morning, uh, at the memorials during the day, or like at the Dayton airport in the evening when we come home, there's, there's, there's a huge uh, surprise reception for them at Dayton when we come in in the evening. The military always come in every trip for every honor flight, whichever airport they fly into. And then they make announcements over the PA system that there's an honor flight coming in at a certain gate. And then all the passengers all around that area will come over and everybody's just waiting and they're all, when the veterans start coming off, they're all cheering and clapping, shaking their hands. And uh, the, the vets have no idea that that's going to happen. During the daytime, we also have a surprise mail call for the vets. This mail call was so important to everybody when you're in the service whether you're stateside or if you're overseas. And so we just kind of reenact that on in the afternoon. We, we, we have all these large envelopes. We, we call out their names on the bus as we're going from one place to another. Envelopes are being tossed all over the bus, just like they used to throw mail to everybody in, in mail call. And uh, so the veterans are really moved by, by the mail they get. You just watch. You just watch their expressions, and you kind of watch them during the day. They're a little quiet in the morning when we first get started at the airport, but then they start um, they start exchanging stories and talking to the other veterans on the trip. And pretty soon, it's like they've got a whole new set of friends. By the time we come back in the evening, the more things we can do for them, the better they feel. The more they really realize that you know people do care about what they did. And for people like me in Honor Flight Dayton or whatever hub it is, it's just such a satisfying feeling that, uh, you know, we're just, we get one trip over, we're just ready to start planning for the next one. It's just a really un unique thing to be part of, and I'm just really fortunate that I have got involved in it. I'm really happy I did. What I look at is the heroes are the ones that, that died, you know, in whatever conflict it is and didn't come home. The rest of us just did what we were trained to do and, and got through and, and came home.